So uh, this is slightly last minute for me. I got asked to do this last night. Um, so hopefully I won't um, mess it up too bad. No, my name's Alex Jervik Acklesberg. I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called ZipTech. And also we have another product company called Provo, which is sort of what we're going to talk about today. And uh, yeah, our booth is just at, literally right outside the door if you want to come say hi at any point today. So um, we're based in Philadelphia. We're about 20 people, 20 something people. Um, we're hiring if anyone's looking. This is everybody, I'm sure. Um, okay, so um, how many of you in this room are familiar with the term ka Kaizen and Kanban? Um, right, so these are old concepts that come from Japanese car companies. Uh, from Toyota in, partic uh, in particular, and the idea being that you can have a continuous sort of improvement if you focus on little small changes and move them through a Kanban board, um, which I'm sure most people here are familiar with. Um, so obviously it's a way to visualize your, your processes, and most of us use th something like Jira, Asana, whatever your um, tool of choice is for us at ZipTech, it's Jira. Um, so I want to talk a little, a lot of, um, are you guys familiar, since you're in the, the testing, I'm trying to use this uh, thing that's not really working. Okay, I know you guys are probably used to the test-driven development, but what we try to do at ZipTech is something which is really called, which is broadly known as shift-left testing. So the idea with shift-left testing is that um, you look at sort of the, the question of like, how long does it take something to get done? And, and usually that's determined by how long does it have to get tr to travel backwards on your board from the right to the, the most right point, which is done. How far back does it have to travel after you've gotten feedback that kicks it back? So the idea in, in, is like, if you think about it from like shoots and ladders, that old game, like how long are your shoots and ladders? Like does, how far does it travel when something is has to go backwards. And if you're in a large organization or a regulated in industry, uh, that can be a pretty arduous process if it has to get bumped all the way back to the beginning. If, if you cannot um, get that feedback early on, then you need, you need to really identify like what's causing, what's causing that distance. Why are things getting, um, why do they have to be so far away? So in shift left testing, it's less of a game so it doesn't look as, this is not the kind of shoots and ladders game that probably is going to be a lot of fun. Because as you'll notice, the shoots and ladders are only ever one space. It's basically just like moving through. And, but this is work. It's not a game. And we don't want winners and losers. And we don't want to have a lot of stress. So we want really for us to all be moving in the same direction up this board together until we get to done. Uh, so the way that we do that, number one, we have to identify what are the bottlenecks in our process. Um, so you, to figure out where your bottlenecks are, you really look at like how long do things stay in each part of your Kanban board? Do they stay in needs developer review? Do they stay in needs client review for a long time? Do they stay in ready for deployment? Wherever they're sitting for the longest, that is how you see that's the bottleneck. You know, wherever things are starting to pile up, um, you, you would think that you found that place that needs to be improved in a, you know, in a production line, if you were thinking about it, like if everything starts lining up at the one most senior person or at the QA person, the quality control person, that's where you figure you have to do your work to sort of get things, um, to, get, to make things more efficient. And those tasks end up being the most expensive and the hardest ones to scale um, in general. Um, so, you want to really minimize the number of things that are being worked on at any time. So your goal in, in sort of this process as you're sh shifting left is to minimize the number of things in work in progress so that everything is either ready for review, ready for um, deployment, or it's not started yet, um, at least as many as possible. Um, oops. So, and the size matters. And, and I say that, like, that in large organizations or in regulated organizations, there's going to be large silos between different departments that are all working on the same issues and that all have an interest in the outcome of those um, of the results of that um, work. And the legal and regulatory issues for large organizations can be pretty intense. Those can be FDA, 
ADA, PCI, um, HIPAA. There's lots of different things where you might not be able to um, get just like an automated sign off on something that these are going to be some pretty severe bottlenecks for most organizations of a certain size. So, and then the other, one of the other factors in, um, oops, sorry. One of the other factors is just the number of steps that something has to be done. And that could be just an indication of how many um, levels of uh, bureaucracy or how many um, different sorts of compliance that you fall under. But really, you need to figure out, like, how many steps do I get to done? And then what do I have to do to minimize the time that it's going to spend in that flowing in that direction? So what we try to do at ZipTech is really shift left all the things. So we try to shorten those ladders and slides. And with, so that basically when we get feedback, it's only going back, you know, you're basically trying to get the feedback and the regulatory um, sign offs all moved all the way back to where the work is being done so that if there's a feedback, if something needs to be changed, it happens then and not after you're already want, waiting to get it deployed someplace. And the other thing is that by doing that, you're able to prevent like code getting merged in together uh, before it's really ready to be deployed. So that's the other thing that we're trying to avoid here is to get things to the point where we can have project managers, um, marketing people, product owners, stakeholders, customers, whoever, whoever the people are, user testers, um, medical reviewers, whoever those people are that need to look at that, that they can do that during this daily sort of, in the daily sort of scrum of, of how things are going. Um, traditionally, uh, and how we were working before we built Probo is that all of the, the testing and stuff would happen at the very end of the project, right? So, and a lot of times that what that would mean is the testing would fall on, at some level, our deployment person, who is almost always the most senior developer working on the project. And, you know, it's sort of like having your, your litigating lawyer do spell check on your documents as you're sending them out. It doesn't make any sense for that level of person to be dealing with that. That, that should be done by the project managers, the QA people, et cetera. Um, so Shift Left does... Uh, it, it includes both the automated parts. We do some automated testing at ZipTech. Um, most of our customers don't get a ton of value out of automated testing, to be honest. Um, there's some level of automation that's valuable, but at a, at a large level, most of them really just want to be able to see and touch and play with the thing themselves and figure out if it works. So um, and in this case, now we're, we're bringing the management and the product of people into this stage. So... This is sort of the, the standard, you know, you go through, you know, here it's in a, you know, somebody creates a ticket, the ticket gets assigned, somebody works on it, then it goes into a queue for the person to, um, to code review it, then it goes into a queue to wait to get deployed to a development site, and then you're like, oh, no, there was an error, it goes all the way back. So the amount of time that this is going to take traditionally would be about 24 days in this case, uh, if you see just like as, as I've lined up the... The days, now it might be shorter than that, but this is just sort of like, this. if this was a two-week sprint, just giving an idea of like sort of that feedback cycle. Meanwhile, in this case, with Probo, basically like every time that we get to the end of something where it's being developed, probably this first one is not realistic, but once you're getting into here, you're skipping, you know, you're getting it down to a couple of days instead of into two weeks. Um, but between when you can sort of give feedback and then fix things, that way, then, you can start to move it towards deployment um, a lot quicker. So the benefits, uh, number one, you know, the, the only way that shift left works is if you're also working in feature branches, uh, which, if you have a live site, is really a best practice and is something that I wish that we had done prior to this. Um, but Provo has really forced us to, to adopt that as a way of working in a way that has been super beneficial to isolating problems as they occur. Because every th single thing that you're seeing in a Probo instance is going, or in uh, whatever system you're working in, Pantheon Multidev or whatever, every single thing is going to be specific to that, only that feature. So you're isolating bugs 
and you're able to catch them a lot sooner as well because you're having people look at it. And, um, and then it also keeps approval a lot more um, fluid and a lot less contentious and also a lot less confusing because if you give someone a site and you're like, okay, uh, here's the dev site. This is what used to happen. Here's the dev site. We have 10 things on that dev site that are in progress still, so you shouldn't look at those. But here, look at these 10 things too. And here's a checkbox and you can go through and try them. Well, that never, ever worked for us. Like they would always come back to the 10 things we told them not to look at and they couldn't get past those things. This way we're like, here's the site that represents the one change. And they're able to just give feedback just on that. And also it keeps us and the stakeholders working in the same sort of um, daily rhythm because now they don't expect that they're not kept in the dark for weeks at a time. Now every day they see, oh, this is in progress, this is in progress. It keeps everybody also a lot less, um, it keeps their stress levels a lot less uh, elevated and keeps everybody sort of feeling like they're part of the same team, which I think is super important. And it helps us ultimately work faster and keep everybody less crazy and helps us communicate better. Um, oops. So there are some things that you can and can and should automate. Um, I'm going to show you a non-automated version of this, but this is one that we've used. Where is it? This is one that we've used at ZipTech uh, recently, which is called Lighthouse. Has anyone here used Lighthouse yet? Um, for those who haven't, you'll see it in a second. But it's a Google tool that's built actually into Chrome that gives you some indications on how your site is performing for accessibility, um, performance, um, progressive web app, SEO. It gives you a lot of scoring and, and sort of automatically tests some of the things that you're doing. And then you can sort of spit it back and decide, okay, well, that's, um, that site is working as expected. But uh, so you can, you can test your deploy steps. You can do visual regression tests, code and quality and unit tests, integration tests, which are sort of the clicking around tests, um, performance, and then accessibility. And I say sort of because we just, uh, one of the sites that I'll show you was actually the first uh, organization to be sued by the Justice Department under the ADA. And as part of their consent decree, they were told they cannot use just automated tools. And that's a very well established precedent today. So if, if you're working with a client that is uh, potentially at a li has a liability for accessibility, um, you have to know that that is, if you just show them, hey, we, we passed it through Site Improve or one of these tenant or something, and it all came back great, they're going to say, well, that's not, that's just not enough. That's not the, that's not the way that this works. You have to have a human being go in and read through the site if that's, you know, either visually impaired or understands how to look at it from a visually impaired standpoint. Um, and that way, that's the only way to really completely comply with the ADA if you're an educational institution, at least, or a public institution. Um, so that's the thing. So you can't automate some things. So, and that's where, and that's really what you're looking for. What are the steps that we could never automate? I mentioned accessibility, but opinions and feedback. Like, that is actually a really important part of these processes. A lot of the times, the people that are working day to day on these things, they don't get to say whether that's like, good enough. Right? Like they could say, you come up with a design, you say, get it approved, wireframes, everything, and then you hand it over to the stakeholder and they go, yeah, that's just not, that's not exactly what I wanted. I wanted it this way or some way different. Um, so those opinions and feedback can be vital to getting this task to done. It's, um, acceptance testing is another one. If you're in an organization that does have severe medical, legal, regulatory compliance um, issues like a pharma company or um, some or uh, financial services or healthcare in general um, acceptance testing is going to be super important acceptance testing meaning like you have a use case and you have a user go in and actually say yes I can do that thing um, again we have certain clients that will not release anything we had one client that wouldn't release anything until acceptance tests were done and then literally they went through every single line of code we committed and had four lawyers and doctors sign everything it never turned up anything, as you can imagine, but they literally sat in a room and signed away, like, I'm going to get, basically, like, I'm going to get fired if this doesn't work, sort of documents. But it never turned up anything, and uh, it was just a kind of futile effort, but that is what they had to do. So 
part of what we're trying to do in, in, within this is really break down some of the silos that develop as a result of, of these sort of um, ways of working. We want to be able to communicate about the project in any channel. That's wherever people are working. If they're working in email, if they're working in JIRA, if they're working in GitHub, we want them to be able to communicate and see and participate from that place. And then uh, we also, chat ops is a new thing. We're sort of, for Provo, we're sort of just getting into it a bit, but, um, but that's gonna be, I think, increasingly important. If you guys are not using Slack, you probably will be, um, or something like that. And a lot of the, the tools in there now are much more interactive. It's, it's actually quite nice. So just to sort of give you an idea, the requirements basically are Git, feature branches, mostly. It's not You don't have to work in feature branches, but it helps. Um, pull requests for Probo, you definitely do. For other systems, you can just point it towards specific branches if you so desire. And the will and the, and the resolve to force people to do it. Um, it. We've encountered severe resistance to this idea of feature branches um, because there's a lot of fear amongst some developers that, you know, if I, if I work too isolated, my, my changes aren't going to get in. I have to, like, push everything in one thing so that I can get it through all at once. But that's really um, going to lead to a lot. It's led for, it led to us for a lot of problems. Uh, this one, um, this slide is really just giving you an idea of some of the tools that are available for these pull request previews. This is not unique to Provo. Um, Pantheon has multi-dev. Platform SH has, has their own sort of version, pull request based version. Acquia had something, I don't know if it still exists. Heroku is the one that everybody copied, including Provo. Heroku was the original one to do like pull request based review apps. Um, I forget what they, I think they're called review apps or something. Netlify, has anyone used Netlify yet in here? It is amazing. Um, and it also has this same sort of concept, but for flat file systems like um, Gatsby, which I have my Gatsby socks on today, um, and uh, and Jekyll and other flat file CMSs, um, Jamstack uh, systems, Netlify is an amazing tool. Then there's also tools that people use locally, Lando being one of them that where it has like an ability, you could share your screen essentially. And screen sharing is actually a version of some of this, not necessarily the most advanced. And then you have Tugboat, which is very similar to Provo, and Codefresh, which is another one that's Docker based and that um, I haven't, we haven't actually used internally, but um, is another one that, that we've heard good things about. So, we're going to just take a look at what this looks like in real life. Uh, so just quickly, uh, and, then we'll, and then I'll get questions. Here, this is just a, obviously it's a Kanban board. It's, it doesn't have a ton of, oops. No, it isn't. Let me see here. Let me... In this case, we don't have a ton of, and this is the one that was, this, so this is public information, so I'm not, I'm not speaking out of school, and we do have a case study about it. So um, LSAC, the, the Law School Admissions Council, who are not far from here, and, and they're the ones that do the LSATs, um, they were the ones who had the first consent decree on the web uh, under the ADA. So they're very sensitive about accessibility. Um, but... This is just sort of a normal Kanban board. You can see here um, things are done, awaiting deployment, needs review, needs internal review. Um, and you can see there's very little in here. And, and that's why this is just one sprint. We do a staff augmentation for them. So this is just like two weeks of work, but they, they just are pushing things through as they work day to day with the customer. Um, so here's, a, here's just an example of a ticket. This is uh, just replacing some textile, right? Like, so, so it's a very simple thing, but in the past, this would be part of, like nobody would have put this in their own, its own uh, feature. This would have been just part of a broader push. And uh, here you can see what they, what they wanted, just to move some, it's a header. I mean, pretty straightforward stuff. But um, you can see here that, um, they, they do have an accessibility person and a marketing person who are going to chime in. And so we definitely have to always, um, you know, kick it back to them, have them kick it back to us. 
Um, and here you can see just like as it's ready for review, this is one that's actually in review right now. Um, it kicks up this. Now this is, this right here um, is, and we're, these are things that, that are also being worked on. The other, in fact, the only one they really care about is accessibility. The other ones are not really um, as important to them, though we do usually force them when we can to, to deal with them. But this is, uh, I'll just run it again since it looks like I have good Wi-Fi. But um, basically, this is, this is Light, um, Lighthouse. You get it in Chrome by just going into developer mode and then clicking on audits. So if you want to check it out on any site on the web, you can. Uh, I'm going to look at it, this site, on desktop. I'm going to look over these statistics. I'm actually going to look, what does it look like when I run it on 3G? Um, so what does it look like on a slower machine? For a lot of folks, that's really important because, especially if you have a lot of less um, affluent uh, users of your site um, or people that are dealing in, you know, in other um, countries that have spottier uh, Wi-Fi access, that can be important. And then it just gives you some, some ideas about, well, why is this happening here? So in this case, though, like we do this and we make sure that this is as close to 100 as we can get. Um, and then they have to have someone come in and actually they read through it with a screen reader and they tell us if that's okay. In this case, let's try to find if I can, let's see if I can find a, uh, oh, this one is for, this is, so here's, and this is an example of an acceptance criteria if you're not using them. Um, given that I'm a visitor, when I navigate to research and data library, then I will see number items next to each facet. Okay, well, let's take a look. I'm in the research library and, oh. I'm looking at it too small, and I see the number of items, right? So like I can just tell as a user, oh, that's what I wanted. But let's say that I didn't like, I don't like that it says 16 items. Maybe I wanted to say 16 articles or something. Maybe I would give feedback like that, or maybe these weren't, if these weren't accessible, or there's lots of things in accessibility that can be pretty problematic, such as these sorts of like, um, you know, searches or tables. Tables are particularly painful. Sliders, things like that. Um, oh, one other thing, one of the things that you don't normally get uh, from an automated accessibility test that having someone actually do it uh, will give you are areas where um, it's the, the contrast is not as good as you'd want it to be. And that, that was a big challenge we had with them because when we first started with their, the design team, um, tried to give them what we felt were more accessible designs and it, what, from an aesthetic perspective, they didn't like it, so we went away from it. But of course, that's when we, when we get to the end and accessibility test it, they had to, they had to accept it as, a, as an item. Um, so this is basically the, I'll just show you. So Provo, if you're interested, works with GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. We do allow people still to do self-hosted uh, Bitbucket, but I think we have one person that's actually using that at all anymore, and I'm pretty sure Atlassian is killing it uh, presently. Here's what it looks like on the back end. You get, uh, and you can have you can have basically any automated test that you want. You could you would just stick in here just like you would on any um, in any system. In this case, you can see that it's logging into Terminus. Um, and which is the Pantheon CLI tool uh, to download. It downloads um, different things that it needs from from their site in order to yeah in order to work uh, like it's going to work on Pantheon. And so it grabs the latest database, etc. Uh, now you can also pin this so that it doesn't get deleted. If you want to say okay, well, because generally speaking for Provo at least these are pretty transient. Um, uh, versions of the site they're really only supposed to be up until the until the pull request is merged and then it's deleted but for some times like people might want to say okay well now like if it's a more interactive element where you're saying i want the ui to work a certain way they, they may say okay well i i like this the way it is but now i'm entering content here i want to see it in a in a different state so i'm going to pin it so even though it's got committed in i'm going to pin it so that it doesn't get deleted uh, we also give access to SSH terminal, Apache, and error logs and such. But this is just being done, I can show you, uh, in a YAML file. So this is, the, this is just the pull request. Um, you can see what was changed. 
here you can see that it, that it showed all these things passing. And then um, if I go into the actual code for the site, I can see this is the, the YAML file. So really anything that you could put into a, uh, just into a, a bash script, you can add as a step. But Probo, Probo also has this concept of plugins. So if you are using Drupal, it'll do a lot of the Drupal-y stuff for you. Um, like um, enable, um, uh, what is it, uh, stage file proxy, stage files, yeah, stage file proxy, which just basically gives you your files without having to have them on this site, so we don't have to download all the images and stuff, they just work. Um, yeah, so that is Probo, and I think that's, I don't know how much time I'm supposed to be taking up here, I could maybe do a little song and dance, but Otherwise, why don't I just take some questions and and uh, yeah, what what do you guys think? How are you? You know, and, and we can have a conversation about how you guys are doing it. Um, yeah. I have a question. <clears throat> so you're moving stuff left during the automation part. Um, are these tests usually run or like code quality and stuff uh, at the developer machine? Tell the developer machine too. Yeah, I mean, if we're doing automated tests, they're being run by the they should be being run on by the developers locally as well. Um, in general, though, we're not going to run, like, the code quality stuff for our team in particular, we wouldn't usually automate that. We would have somebody go in and actually read the code. Um, these are, when you're at the Provo stage, like, when we're earlier in the process, we are not doing shift, like, if the site is not live, we're not doing shift left because you don't need to get as constant feedback, right? Like you don't need daily feedback on, but if, if everything is not ready for feedback, then you don't worry as much. And that, at that stage, we might be more likely to use code quality tests. But again, I would think that that would be mostly local. You would hope that somebody would have already done that before they, um, before they even committed it as a pull request that should be already done. Um, and in our case, like would we have a, um, if, when we look at the Kanban board, there is, that would happen sort of, we do have a uh, internal review, which is a code review stage. Okay. If you were to submit something that in that stage that was not gonna pass code, that, would, that, would, that a code sniffer would test, then we're, we would consider as a company that we have a bigger problem um, in our specific case. If, if you have a broader array of developers in other countries and other locations, then you're less likely to um, be assured, then yeah, you should put that in there because now, should they run it locally? Yes. But I guess what you're trying to get to is a point where you don't have to let them assure you that they ran it, that you have your own assurances. So I would say that you, would, you should have them do whatever tests locally and, on, and then have your own. This is more of like an assurance for the organization. Yeah, I mean, it's more of just like a sanity check at that stage. Like, they should have done it already. Um, and again, like for us, if we ran something through a code sniffer and it sniffed something bad, that would be a, a sort of more HR level problem that we would deal with, like not just a, uh, not just a, hey, you missed a, a line here. That's more of a, oh, what, are, what the what the heck is wrong with you? Sort of situation. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Any recipes you may share? Uh, how do you deal with the integration issues? Because this is one of the main issues with working in the feature branches. It works in the feature branch, but then it doesn't work when you integrate several feature branches together. So. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different ways that you can deal with that, right? But um, you could. So there's a so if you have. Um, I, I think it's it's generally speaking not not something we run into a whole lot. I'll be honest. Like generally speaking. If it works in one location, it really the other feature really shouldn't be breaking it. It depends how big the feature is, mm -hmm. but if you're in a microservice sort of situation where you have two services communicating with each other or using Drupal as a service, you can use Probo for that as well, and we have done that, where basically you can spin up two different versions that are communicating to each other. Now, as far as like getting code merged together without conflict, you know, we tend to, the, the place where, you, where we would tend to see most of that is on the front end, and we try, we try to have as much front end stuff centralized to one person as we can. I know that's not always realistic. Okay. Um, 
but uh, there are ways that we've done it. Um, just, but you know, basically that's that's less automatable. And for us, maybe we would do that level of testing. Like, so we're not getting rid of the need to have that later testing uh, that does test the integration of the overall thing. So we're not getting rid of your dev staging part of your deployment process. You should still do that and have that. And that may that might be the one place where you might find sort of things that conflict that you hadn't found earlier. But what we found is that by looking earlier at stuff, that's very that's much less likely to happen. And you know, in the in the front end, if you're working, you shouldn't have both two people working on the same parts of your front end. And if if one can't work on it without the other, probably you need to look at your theme and see like why is it all a little bit like either they're getting to either things are too general. Right, like they're not being specific enough with what they're doing, or sometimes they're just even like too specific, um, and you you want them to have an overall, um, you know, that you want them to work in a different, you want them to work a certain way overall, and people are not being general enough. But I think it's generally the other opposite way, which is that you, your code is a little too general, and you need to make it a little bit more specific towards what that person is working on, and that way you won't break. Um, you won't break it. I mean, it also, I don't know, I mean, we work a lot with like sort of component-based design, and that also can take a lot of that error away from, the potential away from, from conflict. But we don't see it, you know, since we, we used to see it a lot, right? But like since we moved to Probo, we see it a lot less, just because in general the conflicts were somebody overwrote the wrong thing, or somebody is um, adding CSS files to this pull request that they really shouldn't have added. Um, it's you know people are committing people used to commit in our company and I think that we what we see in other companies is they commit a lot of stuff unexpectedly you know by mistake essentially like that they were working on a, a, a one feature in a in a um, in a theme and and then but then when they committed their files they forgot oh well I was also working on this other one and I committed that too or they commit a whole bunch of other files in with it um, so. There's different ways that you can do it. Um, we do have a we have one customer that will um, every time they make a pull request in Probo, they have um, they have a script that will create a pull request from all their other pull requests. Um, so basically, they have a branch that is um, it's a it's a, they have like each individual pull request, and then at all times they have one f branch that is a combination of them. Nice. So at any time they can go and look at it, but again, I think if you were really to go in and, and look at how many times that has led to a discovery of an error, it's probably been close to, to none. Um, because again, they have, they have a mature process at each level that, you know, by doing QA every step of the way, I think that's maybe to get to your question about, about local testing. Like the whole point is that quality assurance is like a process you should be going through at every step. Um, and so, yeah, I think in their case, by the time it gets to that, it's already been been probably addressed as an issue, um, and they work very well in components based design. But for a more imperfect situation where you have a lot of developers, you have a lot of contractors, I think that's a good way to handle it. You know, basically you just point at a branch and have that branch build constantly from all the pull requests. So they will they were basically recreating it, like killing and recreating it. Yeah, yeah every single time. Um, Right. Yeah, and I mean, it's not, it doesn't take them any, it doesn't cost them any, really anything. Um, they well, just, unless you have conflicts, but yeah. Right. But that's, that's, I guess, the point you're looking for. Yeah. Well, yeah, sometimes, I mean, you know, in front end, sometimes someone, you, you saw an example, like change all the blue titles, uh, blue to, 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 to teal. And there is a chance someone else says, and also in another ticket, make those unbold. And they are basically changing the same CSS rule. They might be changing the same line that says like font teal ball, right? It's like 18 pixels ball. In this case, we'll, we will have conflict while effectively it's not a problem, but. That sounds like a project management problem though, from where I sit. Like if the project manager should be assigning that to the, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Theoretically, I mean, yes, but we, we have like a very widespread structure. See, yeah. People sitting around the globe and yep. teams. It's hard, to, it's hard to connect sometimes, yeah. all the dots, yeah. Great, thanks. Thank yeah. How, how, and, uh, if, if I could ask, uh, you mentioned that company that met uh, ADA's 
sued for accessibility problems. Mm -hmm. What kind of accessibility problems they have? I mean, you can go look at the um, ADA settlement, uh, uh, or it's a consent. They're called consent decrees. Uh huh. Um, so you can actually go see, you can go look at, the, I mean, everybody that's fallen under the, the, the eye of the law, you can go and check it out. It's brutal. I mean, the, the, the thing is what happens to you if you have, so here you go, like, um, like you don't, you need, a. You need to have, like, they, they've had to have, like, a panel. They had to hire somebody. They have to train everybody that uses the site. I mean, if you fail, if they, if they come after you, they make a scene about it. So it's not, it's a very, very, very expensive thing to fix post, you know, after the fact. Um, in general, I think they probably will give you a chance to, like, they'll warn you and then give you a chance. But that doesn't stop you from getting sued from individuals which is different from these sort of consent decrees, mm -hmm. but it's still a, a huge challenge. There's one woman that filed, I think, I don't know, something like a thousand uh, suits under the ADA, one single person. Uh, that has been stopped. They forced her to combine them into a single lawsuit to stop clogging up the court system. Um, but it's still a challenge for sure. But, uh, but they actually have, yeah, so they have someone on staff they have to have, we, in, in the case of this one, we, we actually brought in a third party consultant to run tests. After, even though we did all the testing ourselves, they wanted even more assurance. So we brought in another party that gave a full report. Whatever they found, we changed. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it, you know, I, I think the other thing with accessibility to keep in mind is like accessibility, uh, people aren't the only ones that have challenge with using a site without looking at it, right? Search engines also are not able to visually see your site. They have to rely on the same sorts of, you know, computer sort of assisted navigation stuff to understand what there's, what is really going on on that page. So I, I think accessibility also can lead to much better SEO. Um, and because your pages are gonna be structured a lot more semantically correct and your page, and. Um, and there, and there's going to be descriptions everywhere of what's going on and how to, how you're supposed to be able to use the site. How does this uh, work into your business process? Process in terms of like, I'm a smaller firm, and you know I can see that we would kind of use this as a way to get you know to sign off on various parts of like the, the exactly process. yep. Um, I guess the question is like, uh, is that something you all are doing in terms of like, we are done with this piece of it, like we've done this uh, um, you know, component that gets signed off on, um, and then from a standpoint of like a, like a managing this kind of, type of agreement with your clients, it seems really fluid. Is this like sort of like an agile type of yeah. So I think one of the interesting things for us as a business uh, on the ZivTech side is that this has moved how we've worked with a lot of our clients away from, uh, in many cases, including for LSAC at this point, um, away from strictly project-based and into more staff augmentation-like things where, or retainer-based, like where it's on, where there's an assumption that it's ongoing. And I think it helps to give uh, your clients the the assurances they need that that this is the this is a viable way to work um so i would say on the approval side yeah that's when i say user acceptance test that's basically what you're doing you're saying this feature is is done um that doesn't mean if it was to break when we integrate it into the rest of the site that that would be sufficient like we're still going to go through that next stage but um, it's really helpful to yeah to to get them to sign off on things as we go, and then in the rare case that they come back and say that's not what I wanted, you say well you told me that's what you wanted, you signed off on it. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's what you wanted. So you know if we were in a fixed bid situation or if we were even if we were in a project situation, it's much easier to say, okay, well this is change this changed how we're working. Right. So you need to you know we need to change the the terms of mm -hmm. how we're working together. So it's been. But I would say, like, it's moved many more of our customers into longer-term engagement. So for us as a business, it's been hugely beneficial um, to be able to work collaboratively with them day-to-day. -day, and they don't feel like 
it's like, uh, you know, a lot of times, even if you're doing great work, it can get super contentious on projects mm -hmm. um, because, you know, um, you know, one of the things that when you're working with just a dev site, it, I mentioned, if you still have stuff that's work in progress there, they're going to think you're being sloppy, even if it's just meant to be. Oh, sure, even yeah. if that's right. just the state of the current thing, just the one feature, they're going to, the overall view of it is this thing is broken and I don't know if these people know what they're doing because it's not working. Um, so, so it's helped in, in a lot of ways for us on the business side to work you know, much more collaboratively with our customers. Yep. I wanted to follow up to that because it was what I was thinking. Like, I noticed it seems like you have a really tight connection and like your customers are in your process. Yep. Right. Do you then, it, maybe the answer is you don't do much project work, which is totally cool. No, we do. Um, and so when you do project work then, do you kick out customers who aren't willing to engage on that level? No. No, and we want to. We, we want to meet them where the. So you know, it's some customers want to get involved, sort of in this way. You can't expect that you're going to break down silos by forcing everybody to adopt a new tool. Yeah, fair. Um, I think that's something that a lot of people try to do. Oh well, we'll get everybody to collaborate together, but they're all going to have to work in Jira. Well, you know what? For half of our folks, they won't work in that. They're just never going to go in. They're never going to log in. They're never going to see it. So for us, like, yeah, we have Slack channels for people that'll do it. We have email lists for people that want that. We have Jira for people that want to go in. We have service desk for people that just want to submit tickets. And, you know, we'll work in, we work in Excel sheets. We'll work in whatever they really want. We'll try to push them towards a more technically forward way of working together. But ultimately, like, our goal is to enable them to do their jobs better. So not, it's... It's not always possible to expect that they're going to get out of Skype for Business or whatever kind of crappy system they use and get into your system. You're going to have to go into Skype for Business. Yeah. But this still will give you the links. And we can, you know, if it has an API, you can just use the bash scripts to have it post that stuff automatically to whatever system of your choice. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, then, there's just a link to a site that works. So you can be like, hey, look at it. Um, we do have on our roadmap um, what, we're called, what we call Probo Bar, which is that just like a bar that that pops up to give people more context about where they are, what they're looking at, why they're looking at it, so that they don't have to even know, oh, well, why, what is this thing, and how am I supposed to interact with it, what am I really looking at, to have some way to show them, like, this is the ticket, this is the chat that's happening about it, these are the comments on it. But for now, um, we have our project managers really handle a lot of that communication if they're not in JIRA. Okay. And like people who, there are some clients I've worked with, like, they want to kind of review everything at the end before it launches. You know what I mean? As mm -hmm. opposed to like being in that day-to-day -day sort of scrum cycle. How do you bridge that gap? Uh, well, they can review it whenever they want. Um, they could review it all on, at the end. Um, but I think the key thing in that case, I mean, again, not necessarily ideal situ situation, but in that case, at the very least, things are separated if you're doing it like this, and, and they can make smaller decisions without you having to merge and unmerge code. Um, and then I don't know if they also want to check it all together, but if not, you could just you know um, do the, the last part before you deploy on your own. But uh, I, I think you'd be surprised at how many people like just want to give feedback whenever they get. An e like if they, you send them an email, if they're... I don't know, sitting at their desk, they might just respond right away. Mm -hmm. um, so there are folks who don't want to be bothered every day, who are busy with um, a lot of other projects. Um, but in general, like these aren't like these, these things don't take a long time to necessarily review. Like, oh, there, in that one case, oh, there's numbers on facets. Okay, well, that's, um, that is totally, um, that's very easy to check. So I just look at it. Yeah, it's like you're talking about like breaking things down to manageable chunks. Then. Well, that's the feature branch part. Yeah. Um, so that's why that these feature branches are really. So there's not a lot of stuff being changed in any one of these. It could just be several lines of code, um, and really we're just, you know, just changing a, a, a term. I don't know what it was before items. Um, I could go in to look at the. Uh, go and look at the ticket, which was ninety four. The actual, uh, yeah, just I don't know what it was before. Um, oh, we added number libraries as part of the accessibility ticket, but this needs to be changed to number items. Okay, so that's 
It was an accessibility change that they requested. And again, that's the sort of thing that you wouldn't find with an automated tool, mm -hmm. right? Like that, that libraries in the end, that when they were on some page, they realized, oh, well, hash, that, that this libraries thing was actually a duplicate. That's one of the things you have to look for if there's duplicative um, instructions on the page. So in this case, it's very, it's just a very small change. So you're able to say, okay, well, this change happens here. Now, when we first started with them, it was all just review by sprint and we weren't using Provo because there's just so much going on that it doesn't really make sense at that level. And it's not live yet. So it doesn't really, before it was live, it didn't really um, need that level of uh, assurance or, or sort of testing done all the time. But once it's live, people want to like get that, the, the people make requests, like they expect it to come back in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so most people are not happy to wait for two weeks to see some activity. I mean, that's just been my experience. Maybe some people are busy enough that they're like, I only want it then. But most people that we work with at that stage are, are really in the day-to-day. -day. The people who are doing the work are in the day-to-day -day work of it, not the, you don't, you're not getting stakeholder buy-in at that level to get to change something from libraries to items. Like nobody's ever gonna notice that at the stakeholder level. But at the, except for the accessibility team, that's an important change. Anything else? I just was thinking about um, in terms of this board and overall project management. Do you have it pretty much your project managers are owning this Kanban board? Yes. Do how, do, well, do yes and no. That? I mean, yes, they own the board and they, they really are the ones that are going to pull things first and foremost from to do to in progress. They're going to tell people like this is what you need to work on. Um, but once you do that, then it's part of the internal process. It'll move along as the different checks get done. So uh, needs internal review, somebody's gonna go in, gonna look at the code, gonna look at Provo, um, make sure that it meets the acceptance criteria, and then it's gonna say, okay, this looks good, I'm gonna move it to the next stage, and then, then the PM takes it from there to talk to the client, if the client's not in JIRA, um, and then from there it gets sent back to the de development team to wait for it to get deployed. Um, and potentially to get tested again on the, in the um, development site. Mm -hmm. But the PM absolutely is supposed to own the client relationship and own the board at some level, but uh, you don't want them to become the bottleneck either. So, so a lot of this is pretty automated mm -hmm. and as much as possible is automated. So you use Kanban, do you also use Scrum for like pre projects or do you only? Yeah, so yeah, we do use um, sprints. The only difference really from, from where I sit is really this guy here is that it's, it's by release instead of by a fixed date. Um, the, the only reason that we would, so because we're in a staff augmentation, we continually deploy stuff. We don't, you know, there should be no reason why you can't just deploy stuff today if it looks ready to go. Um, and that's the other thing about this, right? Like it takes a lot of that risk away from like, okay, this looks good. It's, it's good to go, it's live. So it keeps us from having too much stuff um, sitting in this awaiting deployment stage and you can do it one, one at a time. You don't have to wait for all of them to get together. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, right, did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Any other comments? How are you guys working at right now? Anybody, anybody have any interesting tools or techniques or pain points they want to talk about? No, I don't know. You just do this stuff, I mean, uh, just different tools. Yeah, I mean, everybody has to do this in some way. Um, it's just a question of how much can you automate? How much can you, can, how much can it work across your different clients? And for us, like, you know, we can't standardize on Acquia because some of, a lot of our clients are on Pantheon. We can't standardize on Pantheon because a lot of them are on Acquia. And a lot of them, some percentage are just going to do their own thing. And some want to host on some crappy VPN that they signed a 10-year contract for or whatever. Um, there's all sorts of different um, situations that we as consultants find ourselves in. So it allows us to work across them, but everybody's got some, you have to have some way to deal with this because otherwise you're just living in pain. Um, but, you know, I, 
I, I will say the amazing part about being a development shop for 11 years um, and doing a lot of uh, what we would call site rescues is uh, you still see an amazing amount of bad behavior out there. And there's not, there isn't the, some kind of standardizing, standard body, standards body that's going to say, yeah, you're certified as good Drupal developers or as good, you know, you have a good quality assurance process. There's a lot of folks out there that really have no business doing, either doing managing development projects. I think you see a lot of design agencies, for example, that still manage development projects, which is, I mean, sure. Yeah, or, you know, ad, ad agencies, you're like, or print agencies, and you're like, this is not, you know, this is not for the for the web that you're, you got. I did database cleansing one time, and the database varies from, like the one, like I did that, OC48 for Lucent. The way the engineers configured it in the database was crazy. Like, we all looked at each other and goes, does these employees work together at all? And, right. But there were so many different variants of the OC48 in the database, it was amazing. Oh, we see all kinds yeah. of stuff in databases. Yeah. And, and ultimately, like, that's one of the things that, if, if, when we get involved with a project, we'll start putting it into these mm -hmm. systems, and you're like, Wait, why does this take like two hours to run tests? Oh, well, look, the database is like ten gigs. Like, why is that? That's not that's not normal. So then, you know, it's, that's generally speaking, you know, you, where we we're being brought in a lot of times to find that what we call technical debt collecting. Uh, you know, we get I like that. collecting. <laughs> we're technical debt collectors. Nobody wants to be the debt collector. So I don't know if that's a real winning slogan, but that's it's definitely what we're doing. We're going in and we're settling these old debts that they created by working separately or not having written um, acceptance criteria or not really having um, any quality process. I think a lot of times people assume quality is just like an outcome of, of something, but it's, it's really just the process that has been gone through while you're developing. And if you didn't go through it, then yeah, you end up with all kinds of stuff. People in silos off doing their own thing for a long time. Um, and then when you come to try to pull it all together, it's a it's a nightmare. But you know, in general, we would be we would be on the lookout for that when we start working, and that's the sort of stuff that we're like, yeah, we have to kill this because we're not gonna, we can't. It, it it drives developers crazy to have to work with that crap every day of their lives. This is you know this is your nine to five. You're gonna be doing it forty hours a day. This is like your kids see them more than you see these sites more than your kids. So. You know, you better make it, you know, less, it's better to make it less uh, torturous. Anybody else get, got a different way they handle this stuff or, no? All right, well, on that note, push the button and I'm done. Huh.